If you're seeing this video, odds are you've probably also seen some of Wired's tech support videos where an expert answers questions off the internet in their field. You might have even seen this video with a linguist, and despite the fact that he's undoubtedly a better linguist than me, I noticed a mistake. He references a specific and rather famous study that you might have even heard of before, even if you're only a casual viewer of linguistics content. However, the problem is that study doesn't exist. Around halfway through the video, he says this. Linguistic relativity, which is just the suggestion that, yeah, maybe language does affect the way we think to an extent. And there is some evidence for this. Which on its own is fine. In fact, I've made many videos about relativity myself, including this one about all the science in the movie Arrival, where linguistic relativity plays an important part in the plot. But my problem comes with the study that he cites while giving this answer. Some linguists did a study where they showed them a picture of a bridge. In Spanish, a bridge is puente, which is masculine, and Spanish speakers tended to describe the picture they saw as big and strong. But when they showed the same picture to German speakers, for whom bridge is brücke, which is feminine, those speakers tended to say that the bridge was beautiful or elegant. Now on the surface, this sounds all well and good, right? But despite the fact that this study keeps getting cited over and over and over again, it has a glaring problem. It doesn't exist. More accurately, it was probably done, but it's never been published. So the people who keep citing it are either citing a study that they've never read themselves, or they're citing a different journal chapter, which keeps mentioning things about that study, but isn't the actual study itself. So I found the journal study that actually describes that experiment and I read it. So let's dive into it. You can find it pretty easily too if you just Google sex, syntax, and semantics, and I'll include a link in the description. This particular chapter totals 19 pages, including the references. One of those references is the actual study that did the experiment itself, right here. Boroditsky, Schmidt, and Phillips, 2002. Can quirks of grammar affect the way you think? And you'll see right here on the bottom, it says manuscript submitted for publication. Never published yet. But this article here, this journal chapter, was written by those same authors in 2003. So maybe it's just taking a while to get reviewed. Maybe it's due for publication. It just hasn't come out yet. Maybe it was submitted 2002 in December, and then this is written in January, February 2003, something like that, right? Now it's 2025, so it's probably come out by now. No. If you go on Google Scholar and search, can quirks of grammar affect the way you think 2002, all you get are these two citations. And you can click on the citation tool and get a citation and cite that in your paper, but you can't actually open the articles and see the study itself. If you're enjoying this video, by the way, please like and subscribe, turn on your notifications, share it with other people. I would love to make more of these long form YouTube videos. They take a lot of time and research to do though. And when I don't get a lot of views, it's kind of discouraging and depressing. Now, because this journal chapter is written by the same authors, they can reference that study and they know what happened even though it's not published. In fact, they reference this study eight different times in this chapter, and they actually go into a fair bit of detail about the experiments that were done and the results. The famous part of this 2002 experiment is this chapter right here, grammatical gender and object descriptions. And what they did was take native Spanish speakers and native German speakers, showed them pictures of objects, and asked them to describe it with words in English. The point of this was to see if the grammatical gender of their native languages was still affecting the way they were thinking while speaking English. And they chose words that were specifically the opposite grammatical gender in both Spanish and German. So for example, they showed them a picture of a key, which in Spanish is la llave, a feminine noun, but in German it's der Schlüssel, a masculine noun. Although I have to say, because all we have is this journal chapter describing the study and not the actual study itself, we don't actually know what words they were thinking the translations should be. And I do speak Spanish, but not German. So I don't really know if there's multiple words that key could be translated as in German. But the point is all the pictures they showed were of words that they knew were feminine in one language and masculine in the other. So the results say the Spanish speakers described the key as golden intricate, little, lovely, shiny, and tiny, while German speakers described it as hard, heavy, jagged, metal, serrated, and useful. And then to flip the genders around, they also had an example like bridge, which in Spanish is el puente, masculine, but in German it's die Brücke, which is feminine. And they say the Spanish speakers described it as big, dangerous, long, strong, sturdy, and towering, while the German speakers described it as beautiful, elegant, fragile, peaceful, pretty, and slender. But again, 
we don't know what pictures they were looking at. We don't know how many people said each of those words. They were given a picture and asked to give the first three adjectives that they thought of to describe it. We also don't know all the objects they were asked to look at and if the results were similar for all the others. They say there were 24 of them, but we don't know what those other 22 are. The only examples they actually give in the journal chapter are key and bridge. And perhaps the most important thing to take away from this is that other studies have replicated that experiment, but they could not replicate that result. Now, there are other parts that have been replicated, and we'll get into that later, but the important thing is that the famous part about the descriptions, the adjectives for words like key and bridge that was mentioned in that video has never been replicated. Now, I don't think they're lying about this study or anything. I think they really did this, and I think they really got those results. But for whatever reason, it was never published. So we have to consider all the ways it might have had problems, all the reasons it might have been rejected for publication, or maybe even withdrawn from consideration by the authors. We have to consider all the the possible shortcomings. For example, they used 24 words, which seems like a lot for a study, but still 24 words out of all the nouns that there are in existence. And how do we know it's not part of the cultural norm? For example, how do we know that Hispanic and German culture don't just describe those objects like that anyway, regardless of gender playing a part? Well, they tried to solve that problem by doing the same experiment with native English speakers in English. So they used a fictional language called so they used a fictional language called Gumbuzi, which had supative and usative genders. There were 20 objects, including four male and four female people. And they were taught that all these things are supative and all these things are usative. So you can see that all the girls end up in this class and all the boys end up in this class. So even though they're not calling these genders masculine and feminine, these objects are still falling in a certain class and all the masculine animate objects, the boys, fall in one class and all the feminine animate objects, the girls, fall in another. And they also mixed up all the inanimate objects across different participants, but they always made sure that all the boys were in one and all the girls were in the other. And apparently again, as predicted, <laughs> I think it's a bit funny that these authors keep referencing themselves in a study that nobody else has seen and saying, as predicted, this is what we did, we were right. <laughs> but anyway, when the objects were supative and they lined up with the gender with all girls, aka feminine gender class, they described it as creative, curvy, delicate, elegant, interesting, pretty, and wooden. When it was usative, meaning the same class as the boys, and masculine gender, they would describe it as chirping, difficult, impressive, noisy, overused, piercing, shiny, slender, voluptuous, and wooden. So they're saying that the grammatical gender affects their influence of these objects, but I don't think that's quite solid evidence. I mean, here they're saying the English speakers using shiny shows that they're using masculine descriptors for this masculine gender class. But earlier, they just showed that Spanish speakers used shiny for the key, which is feminine in Spanish. So how can shiny be evidence for both of those lining up with gender stereotypes at the same time? Similarly, the English speakers used wooden for both the masculine and the feminine. So how does that show one over the other? And most of these results don't really seem too associated with one specific human gender to me. And then you have words like voluptuous and slender, which are used for masculine. So at the very least, it seems inconsistent. At worst, it seems completely counter to what they're actually arguing. So this is one of the parts that other studies were able to replicate teaching English speakers these gender distinctions in this fictional language, and then getting them to give gender descriptions of those objects. So it's definitely interesting and perhaps compelling to do more research, but it's still not perfect. So for example, they had 20 objects, eight of which were human males and females, four of each. So they ended up with a gender class of 10 words, 40% of which were a female human or 40% of which were a male human, right? So that's a huge portion of that gender class, way more than it would be in reality. And those genders of those nouns will change if you're actually describing a biological male or female object. For example, el gato, the boy cat, or la gata, the girl cat. And there are also plenty of examples where an object is inherently masculine or feminine, but belongs to the opposite gender class. For example, the word masculine in Spanish, masculino, but if you add a suffix to it and turn that into masculinity, which in Spanish is masculinidad, now that's feminine because all the words ending with idad are feminine. In the Irish language, the word for girl is kalin, which is masculine. Does that mean people are going to give masculine adjectives and descriptions when they see a girl? But there is one other section of this study that I want to mention, which is this chapter, Grammatical Gender and Memory. 
Again, referencing themselves and this experiment that nobody else has seen. Again, they used those Spanish and German native speakers who are all proficient in English. They gave 24 inanimate objects proper names in English, and they tested their memory of these object name pairs. And the idea was that if it lines up with the grammatical gender in their native language, then it would be easier to remember. So for example, the apple would be called Patrick, which in Spanish is la manzana a feminine noun. So the fact that it's a feminine noun in Spanish, but Patrick is a masculine name in English, it would be harder for them to remember it. And then for the other side would be named Patricia, for example. So that should theoretically be easier for them to remember because it lines up with their native language gender distinction. But again, they start off by saying, as expected, this is what happened. They say the objects with masculine English names were better remembered when that was a masculine noun in their native language and same for the feminine. But again, we still don't know what any of these objects and their names were. The only example we have is Apple being named Patrick or Patricia. We also don't know the actual data for the results on any of these. All we have is what they've written in this journal chapter and say, yeah, people tended to do something like this. We don't know how strong that relationship was. Was there statistical evidence greater or lesser than a p-value of 0 0.05, which is the standard for a lot of science? For both my bachelor's and my master's degree, we had to take scientific research methods classes where we talked about all these kinds of things. Where we saw published papers where authors said things like, we had results trending towards significant, even though they didn't even get halfway to a statistically significant p-value. Photoshop, CGI, and paintings. I feel like you guys don't even have that. And like I said before, I don't think they're lying about having done this study. And maybe the results they got are significant. Maybe they actually showed what they say they're showing. But the problem is people keep citing this study and this experiment and this research and they've never even seen it because it was never published. And the only thing they could have seen is this journal chapter where they give a bare minimum of information and say, as predicted, we were right with like one example of results. And the thing that bothers me even more about using it in this video is that there are so many good, real examples of linguistic relativity that he could have used. And the rest of the video is great. I highly recommend you go watch it right now with Dr. Stephen Turton from Cambridge University. It's linked below. But like, it's just irksome that the one example he used for linguistic relativity was a study that he hasn't even seen and that nobody's even seen. If you want to see actual examples of relativity, I talk about it quite a lot in some of my videos. For example, in these two playlists on TikTok, I mention it quite a bit, as well as another whole playlist that's dedicated to videos just about relativity. And like I said before, my previous long form YouTube video about the movie Arrival and the book that it's based on. It's about a lot of the other science that appears in those as well, but relativity is one of the main driving forces in the plot. But if you want a video that's entirely focused on just relativity, you can check out this one where I do a little experiment of my own speaking to English speakers in the US and Spanish speakers in Mexico and how they refer to different things in their respective languages affect the way they think and see the world around them. Although this is not published either. I mean, at least it's not a published scientific work. It's definitely not academically rigorous or anything that I would ever try to claim as actual evidence for proving a certain relationship. I was just trying to show some examples that I could think of. But if someone went on wired tech support and wanted to use one of my videos as evidence for something, then I'd probably stop talking crap. I'm kidding. Uh, actually do not use my videos as evidence. Like I said, they're just examples to try to show what I'm trying to explain. Everything I explained was based on research done by linguists much better than me. So there you go. This video is great, except for the fact that the evidence he uses for relativity is an experiment that nobody's actually seen the results of, and there are many other great examples that he could have used. I also upload shorts about all kinds of linguistics topics like four times a week. And I hope you enjoyed this one because it's something a lot of people have talked about and probably seen before. If you have any other questions or ideas you'd like to see a video about, please let us know in the comments. And with that, remember every accent, every dialect, every language, the way everyone speaks around the world, no matter what they look or sound like, are all equally valid and beautiful and you are loved.